Dean McKenzie. I'm Nancy Nangeroni. And this is Gender Vision. We have a great program for you today. We're going to be talking about public policies, and that's going to include anti discrimination uh, laws that have gone into effect, and also we'll be talking about hate crime legislation. And of course, we're going to be talking about public policy with respect to transgender persons, um, a relatively newly identified uh, social group. Um, but one that has long suffered um, severe discrimination, um, serious violence, um, and um, significant disadvantaging in our culture. And there's been a movement um, afoot for uh, more than the last decade, but it's become visible in the last five to ten years. And um, so we're going to be talking about public policy and legislation uh, aimed at reducing violence against transgender people and at um, leveling the playing field on behalf of transgender people. And you know there are 13 states and also the District of Columbia that have hate crime legislation As of already. July 2008. Yes, as of July 2008 and anti-discrimination policy and there, there are well over a hundred different municipalities uh, that also have uh, right. enacted uh, legislation. And I think there's like 30, 39 percent of the population lives somewhere that has some form of legislation, anti-discrimination legislation. That's so that's, that's getting near 50 percent. Yeah, yeah, this kind of legislation is certainly not unheard of. Um, it's becoming accepted. Um, in fact, there was a uh, hearing recently, the last week I think it was, um, in uh, Congress. In, um, it was, uh, I forget which committee it was but uh, there was a congressional hearing around uh, the need for uh, transgender um, uh, equality legislation, non-discrimination legislation. Transgender people um, are routinely fired uh, if they are outed or if they come out on the job um, or they are um, routinely uh, relegated to uh, low-level jobs. They, they uh, face severe glass ceilings and so forth. Um, transgender youth are discriminated against seriously in education Bully. There, there's a lot of bullying in the schools and a lot of kids end up dropping out of school. But that was a historic moment uh, when we saw, we, we actually watched some of the uh, footage for the, right. the testimonies and there was a trans woman that testified who had gotten a job in the Library of Congress who was totally, totally qualified for the job. And uh, when she talked to her supervisor and said she was a trans woman, she lost the job. And that ha happens way too frequently. Seventy percent of transgender people are unemployed or underemployed. Yeah, those of us who, are, who identify as transgender are all too familiar with the kind of discrimination uh, that transgender people are faced with. Um, certainly, uh, we've been denigrated for decades in the media. Um, man and address jokes are rampant. And um, really, it's about um, I mean, the, the deeper issue here is really about winning respect in the culture. Um, um, a person who is transgender, uh, hurting anybody by, else by being transgender, someone born male um, who identifies as a woman and, or who just yeah. enjoys wearing women's clothes isn't hurting anybody else and is just as capable of doing their job and so forth. And by the, by the same token, there are, there are many uh, females who, who transition as That's well. Right. And there are people who are somewhere in, in between. And in the women's movement, there was, uh, it, there was a great effort um, to win the right for women, for example, to wear pants. Bloomers. It was a big thing. Bloomers? It was scandalous, yes. When, when women started wearing bloomers to ride bicycles, uh, everyone thought that it would be the fall of uh, Western civilization and as it was. we know it. it yeah, was. Oh, right, right. It's just, it's <laughs> terrible. But there, there's been a continual uh, 
kind of pulling back on anything that, that gives people a type of gender freedom. But we're, we've made a lot of strides, and we're going to talk with Gunnar Scott, who is the executive director of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition later in the show, That's who's right. going to really talk about a lot of these issues in detail. That's right, and we'll focus on issues uh, of gender identity and expression. We'll talk about public policy. We'll talk about legislation and much more. So uh, the, um, this will be, I think, I think this will be a really uh, eye-opening experience or an eye-opening uh, program for a lot of folks, and it will uh, hopefully be a good reference point uh, for everyone out there who's concerned about transgender equality and rights. Um, in the meantime, though, I think uh, before we go to Gunnar, don't we have, um, isn't it time for us to check in with our good friend? Yeah, we, I, I think we want to talk to the bird with the word. And uh, here today we've got uh, the bird with the word who I think Raving Raven uh, said that birds were the Einsteins in your backyard. I and I'm not sure where a raven <laughs> Got that quote, but uh, yeah, so I think last yeah that was last time, right? La yeah. Last show. That's well, that's what Raven said. Well, we'll see what Raven has for us today. Okay, here okay. we go to the bird with the word. We'll be right back. Raving Raven. Ah, ah. I'm the bird with the word. Hey, Raven. Hey, Nancy. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Well, I've been thinking a lot. Uh oh, it's it's our Einstein from the backyard. That's right. And what have you been thinking about? I've been thinking about how people use the term natural when they, they talk about gender or they talk about sexuality. Natural. Yeah, they sometimes they, they say things are unnatural if they don't like them. They're wrong, Nancy. Ah, ah. So tell me more about that. What do you mean, how do you know they're wrong? When they say, if they say like cross-dressing is unnatural or changing sex is unnatural, well, how, how, do, how do we know they're wrong? Because they're referring to the animal world, Nancy, and I want to tell you about the diversity in the animal world and the big range around gender today. Okay, let's hear it. Okay, do you know that there are some animals that are female that become male and some male animals that become female? Really? Yeah. You, you mean humans aren't the only ones? No, Nancy. You're in the company of shrimp oysters and coral reef fish. Really? Yeah. They all yeah. change sex. They do. And some of them change just one time and then some of them go back and forth. Well, once is enough for me. Ha. Ha. <laughs> all right. So, so uh, wow. So when people um, say that's unnatural, so like, like we were all raised to, uh, to believe that animals just come in heterosexual pairs, just males and females that bond together and all of that sort of stuff. And and that... Um, they told us that Noah's Ark story, but they don't know who they really had on the Ark. Ah, ah. So, so animals really uh, are, much my, are much more diverse, not just in uh, how they relate to one another, but um, in their sex. Yeah, yeah, let me tell you. There are some animal species where there are no males at all. They're only girls. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So, so there's uh, Amazon women on the moon? <laughs> it's Amazon women on the moon for the whiptail lizards. Really? Yeah. So whiptail lizards are all females? They naturally clone themselves. Wow. Yeah. Could this be the future of the human race? I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes there's courtship, too. I think I, uh, courtship. I was going to say that I think there's some science fiction around there. There's courtship, that even though they're cloning? Yeah. Oh, wow. So there's courtship that has nothing to do with reproduction? Well, didn't you say gender and sex are different? Well, they sure are. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Now, well, that's fascinating, Raven. You know, there's also some animals and species that are both male and female at the same time. Really? Yeah. So that would be like hermaphroditic or hermaphrodites? Yeah, again, it's some of the fishes, and there's also slugs and different worms. So sex in the animal kingdom, so we have um, some species that are both sexes at once, that are both male and female, and some yeah. and some that change their sex. That's right. And some, there are no males. Are there, are there any where there are, there are no females? No. Interesting. No, Nancy. Ooh. But then there are some species where the males resemble the females. Where they yeah. resemble them. So that's more like cross-dressing. 
Yeah, that's right, Nancy. And guess what? What? A lot of that's among the hoofed animals. Those with hooves. Yeah. So so cross-dressing runs with hooves. Well, th there's different kinds uh, of cross-dressings. Uh, now, some of them, they just look like the other ones. Yeah. And that's like some of the butterflies. Some of the females might have male patterns, and some of the uh, males might have female patterns. That's African swallowtail butterflies. So I guess when it comes to uh, sex and gender, that um, saying it isn't natural uh, just doesn't hold water, huh? Yeah, I want to tell you about my favorite real quick. What's that? It's the seahorses. What the male seahorse bears and gives birth to the young. She deposits the eggs in his pouch. Oh, so she produces the eggs and then deposits them in his pouch, and so he bears them. Yeah. Oh, that's what makes her a female and him also. You know, you learn something every day. Oh, but it's more complex, and we can talk about that another time. All right, yeah, I think we're out of time now, Raven. We really have to go, but thank you so much. I'm the bird with the word. You certainly are. Bye. 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 Okay, we're back now, and we have our guest, Gunnar Scott, here in the studio with us. Gunner is the director of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition. He's a member of the Massachusetts Commission on Gay, Lesbian, Bi, and Transgender Youth. And he's also a member of the Board of Advisors of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Gunner, welcome to Gender Vision. Thank you both for having yeah. me. Uh, and Gunner's a, a longtime gender activist for uh, many years. Yeah, since uh, 10 years ago, right? Yeah, about 1998. Yeah, great. good for you. And you were... Um, um, you were there for the founding, or shortly after the founding of MTPC. I was um, one of the found. I am one of the founding members. Uh, the organization was founded by Jennifer Levi, who is an attorney at GLAD, and yeah. Cole Thaler, who is an attorney at Lambda Legal. So what now, is it? So what is it? Let's talk about what is MTPC. What is MTPC? What is, yeah. Um, we are an or, a transgender organization. It's, it's just a bunch of crazy trannies who are saying <laughs> we want more. <laughs> well, we don't like to use no, the word not. trannies. No. Um, actually, Oops. yeah. <laughs> We, the organization is a political organization, and our, our main goal is to end gender identity, gender expression, discrimination. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, we are run by and for transgender, gender nonconforming, and allies um, in the community. So we're made up of um, approximately 25 or so core members, mm -hmm. um, and we have now, we're going to be up to four chapters um, across the state. So we have a Boston chapter, a chapter on the North Shore. We're having one start in Worcester, and we're also having a chapter start on the South Coast or the New Bedford Fall River every year as well. And, and, and by way of fair disclosure, we should um, admit that uh, um, Gordian and I run the North Shore chapter, <laughs> and that, that I'm the chair, chair of the board of uh, the board of the steering committee. That is MTPC. Yeah. So just by way of disclosure. And I mean MTPC. I mean we're we're following in the footsteps of a number of other uh, transgender activists. Um, are, we're modeled very much after uh, another organization that ceased to exist after the passing of its founder, Penny Ash Matz, and that organization was It's Time Massachusetts, um, and Penny did a lot of work and, and really laid the groundwork for a lot of the work that we're doing now. Um, and uh, there's other gender activists around the state that also laid the groundwork in different policy areas, and so um, it was their work that has enabled our organization to move forward and, and to do some of the work that we're doing now. So now we mentioned earlier um, some of the ways in which transgender people um, are discriminated against um, and they suffer violence and so forth. Let's talk about some of the things that MTPC is doing, mm -hmm. uh, some of the projects uh, MTPC is working on. What would you say are like the big three or you know, what, are, what are some of the primary projects? Mm -hmm. I think the, the first project that we're working on is trying to pass a statewide law for non-discrimination on the basis of gender identity, gender expression, and also amend the hate crimes legislation to include transgender or gender identity and gender expression. That's usually, transgender people are, are in the, that category of gender identity and gender expression, but that category extends out for gender nonconforming folks, so that could be folks whose sexual orientation is lesbian, gay, bisexual, or heterosexual. Who's, who, are, who are discriminated against because of their gender. The way they present their gender. So yeah. somebody who doesn't look female or feminine enough, or someone right. who doesn't look masculine or male enough, yeah. can also be discriminated against, and there's been a, a couple of cases around the country with, with cases like that. 
um, or someone who doesn't fit those gender stereotypes or those expectations of what someone should look like based on being male or female. And, and why should people's gender be policed? The case that I think about uh, all the time is the case in uh, Reno, which is very well known, where a casino worker was working for 25 years in the same mm -hmm. job and they decided that they were going to do makeup classes and she never wore makeup and she was an excellent employee and did really really good work so when uh, they said do makeup classes she thought well they're not going to ask me to do it but they did and uh, she said that's not who I am I don't want to do it and she thought she had a really clear clear case mm -hmm. but she lost Right. She, she lost her case, meaning that your employer could tell you what kind of gender presentation you have mm -hmm. to, to do. Yeah. And, and that is a lot different. And I think one of the things that gets confusing is a lot different than your employer requiring you to wear a uniform. Yeah. And sometimes that gets confusing. As long as for a transgender person that the uniform that they are required to wear is based on their own gender identity That's and right. gender expression. So if you're a male to female trans woman, and there is a female uniform, then you should be wearing a female uniform. So, yeah. so in other words, um, this law you know, wouldn't make it uh, legal for um, males to wear fishnet stockings right. and micro mini skirts to right. work, that sort of thing. Unless, of course, they are a cross-dresser and, and that's their job is to go out cross dress But yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's not but in, in, reality, in, in no way. way. Yeah. yeah. So basically, this law is saying that someone cannot be fired from their job denied services and public accommodations, um, denied housing, denied credit at a bank based on their gender identity or their gender expression. And there have been court cases in Massachusetts mm -hmm. around these things. In fact, there was one woman who was sent home from a bank, right. um, told right. she should come back dressed as a guy, and then they would, uh, she was a trans woman, and, mm -hmm. and, and she won that court case. So there have been some court case wins. Right. Um, and so why do we need this law when we've been winning some cases in the courts? Um, because a law is not only does it, it have intervention, but it's also about prevention. Mm -hmm. The way that I look at this is that we want to prevent discrimination from happening. Mm -hmm. And I don't think all discrimination is blatant, like I'm out to discriminate against someone. I think a lot of times it's that people aren't educated That's and right. they don't know that you really should not be doing this. So uh, the law basically puts that on the table. It, it creates a, 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 like a starting point for everyone. So by having a non-discrimination law, whether it's a state law, a federal law, a city ordinance, you know, a public a policy at a corporation, it, it advertises like this is not going to be tolerated here in this place, wherever that might be. Um, so that is prevention. Mm -hmm. And then it also is intervention. So if someone does experience discrimination, there is a path for someone to then make a complaint or have some sort of retribution around that. Um, because, some accountability. Right, because to bring a court case is actually expensive and it's very, very difficult and to get. And it takes a long time. Very yeah. long time. So, yeah. I mean, so many of those cases, average time before they got to final decision was about two years. Wow. That's so huge. that, you know, it's not like. So you, if you've been fired two years later, isn't going to be much help. Right. And you're going to yeah. be in a totally different place in your life. Yeah. Um, and for some people, they may not even be in the same city or town or whatever it might be. So this is a little bit. You know, the wheels of justice do turn slowly, but here is a way, again, for prevention, yeah. intervention, and then accountability. Well, even if someone gets a job and they're accepted by most of the people in the, in the workplace, a transgender person in the workplace, there are also issues around the bathroom that, that people get dangerously crazy about sometimes. Could you tell us a little bit about what's being done around that? Or I mean, I think that... <laughs> Well, one, the, the issues around bathrooms are what I call a red herring. Like, they are. the idea that, you know, bathrooms are not a safe sanctuary. Like, this idea if you put a sign on the door that it's going to stop somebody from committing a crime yeah. is really not true. Um, when I was working on changing the ordinance in the city of Boston, mm -hmm. bathrooms was definitely the big issue. Like, what happens if somebody dresses up like a woman and they're not really transgender and they go into a women's bathroom and they commit a crime? Doesn't happen. The reality, though, is that somebody who's going to commit a crime, they're not going to put on an outfit to go do They're that. not going to take all right. that time to do it. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, yeah. when we were actually yeah. um, meeting with city councilors, there was an incident on the Cape with a man who followed a woman into the women's restroom and sexually assaulted her and murdered her. And he oh was not God. dressed as a woman. No. He, he just, again, the sign on the door did not stop him. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the idea, there is no such thing as safe space, and I think that yeah. we set up this, like, idea that, that a woman's room is a safe space or a men's room is a safe space. No, it, you know, it does, 
it does make a space to say we have sex segregated spaces and that we expect people whose gender identity and expression are going to access those sex segregated spaces. What it really does, I, I mean, if, if, if yeah. I may, what it really does is it uh, seems to me is that it um, unfairly scapegoats transgender people mm -hmm. for crimes that are committed right. by perverts or whatever, by people who are, you know, willing to do harm to others, whereas transgender people have to use the bathroom sometimes. Well, that, I think that's and they the need real to do it key, safely. The key issue yeah. that uh, some of the lengths that uh, that people have to go to in terms of not eating anything all day long because or, they can't use the bathroom yeah, safely. Going blocks away. I mm -hmm. mean, just basic, basic yeah. human rights and civil rights. We're talking. And then about more here. often than not, transgender people are the target of of violence or harassment in a sex that's segregated right. space. Yeah. In fact, um, there was a transgender um, woman. Was it? Was it? Um, was uh, she was in New York City? Oh, that was, she wasn't actually transgender. She wasn't oh. transgender. No, she was a lesbian woman who identifies as a woman, and her presentation, her gender presentation, is on the masculine se spectrum. Yep. So she was butch. I mean, looking. in the reality, she has short hair. Yeah. Yeah. And would she? I mean, does she identify as butch? I, we don't know. She's never said that in we public. Don't know her identity. But she, she has short hair, um, and she's also African American. Oh. So I think there's also there's this play around visibility. Yeah. And the targeting of visible attributes. So and race a lot is really of interacting crossover. with that too, right? right with gender. So sure. you know, was the person who, when she went into the women's restroom, was that be, was she being targeted based on her race, based on her gender presentation, sure. based on the assumption around her sexual orientation, based on how she looked? Yeah. So there's all things playing into this. Yeah. And you know, what I say is that people who hate don't necessarily differentiate between those that's visible right. attributes. That's right. They just make an assumption and use language that's, that's you, you know, against somebody. Um, so she won that case. She identifies as female. Her birth sex is also female. And so she won the case to say she can use the women's room based on, you know, how she identifies and how she lives. Even though it might make some people uncomfortable because right. she's not completely obviously a woman. She looks, she has some masculine Well, she qualities. looks masculine to some people. Yeah. And again, okay. I think it also is based on cultural perception, sure. you know, oppression. You know, there's, there, in different cultures, there's different gender presentation. But because we're here in the United States, there's an assumption that we're all going to follow white culture and right. the stereotypes around that. Yeah. And that's not the same for each culture no, and each no, we're ethnicity. Gonna be really, we're going to be really divided, extremely divided. I want, I want to point out also that um, the problem isn't just people that hate. It's also people who are uncomfortable, people who become uncomfortable and who seek remedy for their discomfort, who, who will act out their discomfort mm -hmm. against transgender people. So it's not, not necessarily always the haters. Sometimes it's just the people who have a knee-jerk reaction mm -hmm. to their discomfort. But you and know, we had, a, we had an experience um, yesterday or the day before actually Nancy and I went to get our annual blood work done at a new doctor that that we're seeing and we were sitting there and and she was taking some of Nancy's uh, family history and she asked uh, how many children were there and what sex they were and, and how healthy they were and Nancy said well there were four of each but you what did you say you do know I that said, I'm well, you, transgender well I said you know that was back when I was a, back when I was a I guy, was a guy right? and yeah. her mouth <laughs> just dropped down to the the floor now she's an awesome woman but we gave her the space and told her it was okay to have a reaction like that because maybe she wasn't used to it. And in that space, she recovered herself and she was she was absolutely fine and, mm -hmm. and very gracious about things. But she needed to have that sort of you know space of something she didn't. didn't I actually expect. would disagree. Would She's you a disagree? medical provider, yeah. and she should have been trained around transgender people. Oh, and ideally, yeah, ideally. I think I mean, and that's part of the work of MTPC and other transgender political organizations around the country is that you know folks That's who are right. accessing any sort of basic services whether it's health care yeah. um, whether it's homeless shelter services that those folks are should be required to have training and work with all kinds of communities and they don't right um, and that's part of our work and along with non-discrimination laws and policies is also targeting like the department of public health the department of transitional assistance to say that you know we also should be able to access basic services and be respected yeah. for who we are and be treated well. I mean, that, that's really the issue, isn't it? it respect is. and being treated with respect. Let's talk about some of those public policies mm -hmm. that, that we need, where we need to incorporate a recognition of the existence of transgender people because of the, um, the issues that we face. Can we just, we, we, we only have about five minutes mm -hmm. in, in this right. segment. We'll do another segment, but 
Um, can we talk a little bit about some well, of the I policies? Think, I think you both touched on something earlier in the introduction of the show, which was looking at how many transgender people experience poverty. Yep. And so the national studies, there's not been a lot, but the few that are out there say that up to 70% of transgender people experience right. some form of poverty or living below the poverty line, which means that we have a high percentage of folks in our community accessing services then for those who are economically disadvantaged. Right. Whether it's homeless shelter services, services to prevent homelessness, food kitchens, food pantries, those types of services. So our community is, is, is accessing those services, yet the policies there don't always reflect who's you know, accessing them, mm -hmm. meaning that a transgender woman is sometimes required to access services for men because her ID oh. says that she's male because she can't afford to have sex reassignment surgery, which is what you need to change your ID. Yeah. So we have a really high bar for some people that are, you know, to access services for people who don't have economic means right yep. so the mean you know so the to change your gender marker you have to access sex reassignment surgery which is not covered by health insurance and which to access expensive. services for yeah. how you identify so it doesn't add up yeah. so part of our work is to say no somebody who identifies as female should be allowed to access services that are sex segregated for women That's so right. if you're if you're a transgender woman you should be placed on the women's side of a shelter or be able to use you know the food kitchen for the women um, okay. because to send a transgender woman into a men's shelter is going to be highly disruptive. It's dangerous. And she's going to be targeted. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's part of our work is to, to educate those folks who are doing that. And part of it, again, is just education and yeah. to say, okay, so these things don't add up. Um, the same thing with working with the registry of motor vehicles to try to change their policies around people being able to change their gender marker and making it a little less rigid. We have one of the ri most rigid policies in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot, and, and our work is, is not just unique to Massachusetts. I think that there are a number of s transgender political organizations around the country. I think there's about 20 different organizations now, and we're all doing similar work. At we're all just at different places. You know, folks in Vermont have a non-discrimination mm -hmm. law. Folks in Maine have one. Folks in Rhode Island have one. Folks in Connecticut do not. So we're kind of on the same vein. Um, so we're all at different places doing this kind of work. Wow. There's, there's just so much there that needs to be um, gone after. Um, it's a lot of work to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about, we, we, we have just a couple of minutes left in this segment. Um, let's talk about, um, for example, um, well, let's see, we talked about the homeless shelters, mm -hmm. we talked about the registry of motor vehicles, we talked about the high bar that it takes. Um, let's, let's just talk for a minute about... Um, jobs? Okay. okay let's <laughs> <talk about jobs. laughs> I know you probably had something in mind. No, that's okay. Yeah. Um, let's talk about jobs and then and, and what MTPC is doing with respect to helping um, in the employment discrimination area. Well, one of the things that we would like to do next year um, is to have a transgender job fair. And there have been other cities that have done this. New York has done this. San Francisco has done this. And so um, we've started to investigate what, what would it be like to put on a job fair that is specifically for transgender people. We might actually expand it out to, for transgender people and for um, young GLBT folks because sometimes a lot of the issues are very similar. For young GLBT folks, they don't have the same level of work experience. And so trying to get a job it's a little bit more difficult. And I find that it's also often similar to transgender people who, who don't necessarily have the same level of work experience at an age. Like if you're 35 years old and you're a trans woman and you've been working under the table, you don't have the same resume as a 35-year-old non-transgender person. Yeah. And the same thing with a young yeah. person who's GLBT. And so, so we've been playing with that idea of possibly expanding it out to transgender folks of all ages as well as GLBT youth under the age of 24. That's phenomenal and, and it's so much needed. That, that's really terrific. Gunnar, um, we're out of time now, mm -hmm. but um, we'll come back. We're going to do another segment because um, there's so much more to talk about, but we want to thank you so much thank for you. being our guest thank on Gender Vision. And for the work that you continue to do. Thank you. Really important and life-saving. All right. Well, that does it for this Gender Vision. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed watching. Thank you for being with us. And we'll be back uh, with much more Gender Vision very soon. So, And remember, uh, you too can stretch your Gender Vision. <laughs>